I'd like to call this meeting to order and uh, invite you all to stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. D, if you'd take the roll for us, please. Mm -hmm. Director Stewart. Present. Director Wallace. Present. Director Nicholson. Present. Director Epen. Present. Director Yee. Present. <clears throat> Thank you. We'll now move on to our consent calendar. Uh, the consent calendar consists of those agenda items that have the board will approve with one motion un unless a member of the board or a member of the public uh, requests to remove an agenda item from that consent calendar. If any items are removed from the consent calendar, the board will take action on the, rem on the removed agenda item later in the meeting under the action item headed heading of, that ad of the agenda. So uh, does anyone of the board uh, want to remove an agenda item from that consent calendar? Seeing none. Uh, does any member of the public uh, want to remove an agenda item from the consent calendar? Seeing none, uh, may I then have a motion to approve the consent calendar items A through G? So moved. We have, we have a second. motion and a second. Second? Uh, Was there a second? Yeah, Dr. Oh, yes. Okay, good. We got a second. So, uh, Director uh, Nicholson, if you'd like to present that item. Oh, uh, the, the motion? Mm -hmm. uh, in accordance with district law, policies, and procedures, I move that the Board of Directors approve the consent uh, calendar items A through G. Good. Uh, and we have a second on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, D, if you take the roll on that. Director Stewart. Aye. Director Nicholson. Aye. Director Wallace. Aye. Director Epen. Aye. Director Yee. Aye. Thank you very much. It's nice to have those items taken care of. Uh, we're now open to uh, oral communications, if there are any from the public. Uh, seeing none, uh, we'd like now to have the Dr. Kil Dr. Killaroo present the uh, Chief of Staff report. Thank you. We have four new um, physicians coming in for an initial appointment for two years. Dr. Harsha Agarwal, uh, Medicine Interventional Cardiology, Dr. Jess Alexander, Radiation Oncology, Dr. Janet, Jonathan Lai, Emergency Medicine, Dr. Tony Yuan, Emergency Medicine. We don't have anybody for a one-year initial appointment. Dr. Harsha Agarwal is asking for temporary privileges for interventional cardiology. We do not have any locum tenens. We don't have any extension requests. We do have one waiver request for Samyukta Lokeshwar, nurse practitioner with the emergency department. And then for the two-year reappointments, we have Dr. Carmen Aquilili, intensivist critical care, Dr. Ritika Olak, family medicine, Dr. Amy Herald, obstetrics and gynecology hospitalist, Dr. Ravinder Kailan, neurology, Dr. Paresh Matmari, internal medicine hospitalist. Dr. Andrew Phillips, intensivist, critical care. Dr. Uh, sorry, nurse practitioner Richard Quetas, uh, with uh, Dr. Bruce Lynn, radiology. Uh, Dr. Charmati Raghu Subramanyam, internal medicine hospitalist. Dr. Sandra Wong, family medicine. We have a uh, reappointment for one year. Dr. Harry Andrews, emergency medicine, Dr. Alok Bhattacharya, neurology, Dr. Shakira Kirpinani, gynecology, Dr. Kenneth Kelson, gastroenterology, Dr. Veena Puri, pediatrics, Dr. Moses Tagioff, neurosurgery. We have one physician as a non-reappointment deemed to have resigned, Dr. Robert Means. In transfer of staff, uh, staff category, we have Dr. Alok Bhattacharya, neurology, going from active to ambulatory. Dr. Mary Boris, Borses, cardiology, going from provisional active to active. Dr. Siolet Chantachote, family medicine, going from provisional active to active. We have Dr. Jessica Fuller, pediatric hospitalist, going from provisional active to active. Dr. Aray Ketzler, going from emergency room medicine, going from provisional active to active. 
Dr. S I'm sorry, Nurse Practitioner Samyukta Lokeshwar, going from Provisional Allied Health to Active Allied Health. Dr. Gavi Salehe, uh, Emergency Medicine, going from Provisional Active to Active. Dr. Emi Yoshida, Radiation Oncology, going from Provisional Active to Active. And we have completion of proctoring and eligible for transfer of staff category, Jacqueline Dow, nurse practitioner, again with the emergency room department, Dr. Halimi, provisional allied health to allied health. And completion of proctoring advancement of staff category, again we have Dr. Mary Borses, cardiology, provisional active to active, Dr. Siola Chantachote, family medicine, provisional active to active, Dr. Jessica Fuller, pediatric hospitalist, provisional active to active, <coughs> Dr. R.A. Kessler, uh, emergency medicine, provisional active to active, pending his deep sedation privileges, Dr. Samyukta Lokeshwar, uh, nurse practitioner, uh, poor privileges, provisional allied health to allied health, Dr. Mark Penner, emergency medicine, deep sedation, active, Dr. Webe Salile, uh, emergency medicine, provisional active to active, pending deep sedation. Dr. Emi Yoshida, radiation oncology, provisional active to active. Extension of proctorship uh, f and provisional category for one year. Samyukta Lokeshwar, nurse practitioner. Uh, again, emergency physician, uh, emergency department with Dr. Halimi. No new privilege requests. Uh, Dr. Tracy Huynh, uh, cardiology is deleting some privileges. Um, there were no conflict of interest statements updated. There was no leave of absence. Uh, there is withdrawal of applications from Dr. Scott Lawler and Dr. Samir Mehta. Um, and then resignations, we have Dr. Uh, Evelyn Kabibi, a hematology oncology, uh, nurse practitioner Milan Chakravar from the emergency room department, uh, nurse practitioner Brenda, Brenda Castolo from the emergency room department, Dr. Roger Goldberg, ophthalmology, uh, Lance Heine, physician assistant with cardiac surgery, Dr. Kenneth Lowe, ophthalmology, Dr. Doris Nguyen, internal medicine hospitalist, Dr. Carlos Perez, internal medicine hospitalist. And that is it. Thank you. Uh, do I have a motion for approval of that? Mr. Mr. President, I move for approval of the credentialing action items as presented by Dr. Killaroo. Thank you. Second. We have a motion and a second. D, if you'd take the roll on that, please. Director Stewart? Aye. Director Nicholson? Aye. Director Wallace? Aye. Director Epen? Aye. Director Yee? Aye. Thank you. That motion passes. Uh, we're ready now for a presentation of the result of our annual audit uh, for t f physical year 2019. What I, I'd like to take a moment to, um, I know Chris Henry, uh, Vice President Chief Financial Officer, but also want to um, welcome Michael McBride, our CPA from PricewaterhouseCoopers, and give you a little bit of background on, on uh, Mike. He is an insurance partner based in San Francisco. Mike has over 30 years of experience providing auditing and business advisory services to a variety of clients, including large academic medical centers, integrated delivery systems, including captive insurance companies, foundations, and higher education organizations. In addition to providing accounting and auditing services to his clients, Mike has devoted a significant time to performing financial feasibility studies, assisting clients with debt offerings, internal control reviews, and internal audit projects. Prior to rejoining PwC, Mike was an administrator and director of business services for a primary care physician group practice and management services organization, where he developed and implemented corporate restructuring that included a new physician compensation mo uh, model. Mike is a member of the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants and is certified in California and Connecticut. I'd like to welcome Michael McBride. Good evening, uh, members of the board, uh, members of the public and uh, management. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to continue to be up here. Uh, I think I've made similar presentations for the last, uh, and I hate to say that over 10 years, and I think Kimberly, I was just saying uh, to one of your colleagues, I said I, I stopped counting years after 30. So um, we'll go with that. But uh, I'm here to present the results of the audit uh, for 2019. Uh, the audit is complete. Uh, we are, uh, 
prepared to issue our financial statements, uh, our opinion on the financial statements this year. It will be an unmodified opinion, uh, which is um, uh, AKA for a clean opinion in, in, a, in audit speak. Uh, and I wanna just go through a couple of items with, uh, with the board and the public uh, this evening. You know, certainly one, I wanna call out a couple of the accounting and auditing areas that we do, the more meteor areas. Uh, I want to just convey to the to the to the folks here tonight. You know, when I think about other presentations I've made in prior years, this is probably the one that had the least amount of accounting standard impact. Every year, I feel like I've gotten up here and talked about new accounting standards, whether it was you know particularly around the uh, uh, employee benefit area. We haven't had to deal with any of that year, so it was a little bit of a quiet year from an accounting uh, perspective. Um, and and so, but it wasn't necessarily a quiet year for, in, in auditing because we had a new building come online and we had other things that we had to deal with. But from a pure standard setting perspective, it was a quiet year. Uh, in terms of uh, changes to the audit plan, uh, annually I present to the board my, my uh, how uh, I see the risks and how we're gonna deal with those risks every year. I'm pleased to report that as the audit progressed, there were no changes uh, coming out as we executed the audit. Uh, key events, the key event this year was bringing a new building online. <clears throat> and what that meant from an audit perspective was we had to uh, do a little bit more testing around uh, the capital spend in that area, but also too to make sure that once the building was online, it was properly placed in service and was properly getting uh, depreciated uh, in accordance with uh, the accounting standards. Uh, I can tell you that we identified no misstatements. So there were no adjustments that came out of our audit that were either booked by management or we found and did not get booked by management. So there's nothing on what we call our score sheet. And then from an internal control finding perspective, again, we're not here to audit the system of internal controls, but we certainly look to the system of internal controls to assess the design of those controls in place in, in key areas. Uh, and I'm pleased to report that we're not aware of any material weaknesses uh, in that control environment. Uh, I get up here and I present just a summary of uh, the, the financial statements every year. Uh, this, this is the statement of net position or uh, balance sheet. Uh, and here you can see year on year, it's about a billion, a little over a billion dollars in total assets. Uh, compared to the prior year, not a significant amount of change, a little bit less, about $30 million less year on year. Uh, two things I'd say I'd call out there, you know, one, certainly uh, paying off payables, funding the, the pension plans, but also, two, a little bit of a loss coming out of that because you did have the impact of bringing a building online, which you'll see on this page. So this is uh, the statement of changes uh, in net position or an income statement. Uh, and if you look at the two consolidated columns, you'll see uh, year on year about a $30 million swing, $30 million less net income year on year. Again, I think two things going on there. One, certainly the, the cost of bringing out a building online. But the other area too is just inherent when you're looking at an organization that has a pretty significant governmental payer mix, the pressure on, you know, is there, are those payer rate increases keeping up with the cost increases of running, uh, running a hospital? And I think that's the dynamic that's going on there. From an audit risk and results perspective, just to remind the board uh, and to uh, present to the public, when we think about risks, we have two what I'll call significant risks. Significant risk are what auditors think about and how, where are we gonna spend the most time in those areas. One is around the valuation of patient accounts receivable. That was our preliminary assessment. It was our final assessment. Uh, we spend a lot of time making sure that those estimates that management makes on the ultimate collectability of its revenue are reasonable and within reasonable ranges. I'm pleased to report we had no findings in that area. And then management override of controls. This is where, where could management go around the control environment and impact the financial results? So we do look for instances of that. Again, pleased to report that we saw no, no instances of that. The column on the right in terms of scoping, you can see when you think about this organization, it's not just one organization, there's, multi, there's multiple entities within it. Uh, and you can see where we give full scope audits to those, which means a separate opinions, as well as limited scope. There's nothing that's not touched. Consideration of fraud, uh, again, every year I get up here and I talk to the board about what we have to do as an organization, as an audit firm around fraud. Uh, while we're certainly not going to detect every instance of fraud, we do look for and understand what are the systems and processes in place that this organization has around whistleblower programs, make sure they've got strong controls, certainly the role of the board. Um, and then what can we do to see where could management try to, again, affect 
uh, something in the financial statements, and we do test and look for instances of material instances of fraud. Uh, again, you know, when you pull all this together, uh, again, please report we're not aware of anything and certainly didn't find anything in that regard. So patient service revenues to accounts receivable, as you can imagine, when you look at a hospital and the financial statements, this is the single largest area that we focus in on. Uh, it's complex. There's a lot of moving parts. Uh, so on the, the, the pie chart shows the payer mix here. And if you were to add up the Medicare and the Medicare HMO with Medi-Cal, it's a pretty significant governmental payer mix, okay? Um, but, you know, in terms of the procedures performed on the right, you can see those. There's a lot of detailed testing that goes on here, going back to patient files, going to remittances, you know, testing all the data that we get from, uh, from the organization to ensure that this, this information is complete and accurate. Uh, and it also helps us in terms of how we assess the collectability. Investments in restricted funds, when I think about the balance sheet that, that, we, that I showed up earlier, this is the, the largest asset on there, second to fixed assets, which we do a fair amount of detail testing. But two things around investments. One, we certainly want to make sure that they exist so we confirm them all. And then secondly, we want to make sure they're valued right so we test the valuation. Um, but we also look to make sure that you know the disclosures are appropriate, they're consistent with the types of uh, policies and procedures that you have here in the organization, so we do that as well. And again, uh, pleased to report we've got no findings in this area. And then capital assets. Uh, again, this is where you can see the big increase of uh, the building coming online, uh, which was a phenomenal accomplishment, by the way. I know the organization's been working on that for the last several years. Um, we do a lot of detailed testing in this area, making sure that what goes in there is properly capitalized, making sure that any interest costs that need to be capitalized were properly capitalized. Uh, and then again, once that building was brought online to make sure that it started to get depreciated uh, accordingly and the interest is no longer being capitalized, it now has to be expensed. So when you think about the cost of bringing a building online that was going through that statement of changes in that position before, uh, you know, those are two big uh, expenses that uh, are now uh, going to be hitting the organization prospectively. And then when I think about uh, required communications, these are things that my profession believes are important that we communicate to those charged with governance. Uh, when I think about uh, uh, disagreements with management, pleased to report that there were none. We had the full uh, cooperation of everybody involved, right, from Kimberly to the board uh, and to the, the financial team and legal team here. Uh, we appreciate the cooperation we get. Uh, it is, you know, the audit is intrusive and it touches a lot of parts of the organization and we appreciate the, the cooperation we got throughout. Um, no, no material inconsistencies, no departures from our standard report. Um, and again, if I were to reflect back on if you were to think about a barometer of what to take away from the quality of the audit process, and I talked about this earlier, no identified misstatements and no significant, you know, deficiencies, material weaknesses in internal control. Those are two pretty good statements to think about. Uh, coming out of the audit. I think that's a, a good way to characterize, um, you know, if you had to assess the quality of uh, the organization from a financial perspective, that's what we look at. So I know I went through that relatively quick. I'm mindful of the time and the agenda that everybody has. Uh, but again, I very much appreciate the opportunity to be up here in front of everybody and present uh, this report. And I, again, appreciate the cooperation uh, and attention that everybody gives this process. So thank you very much. Do we have any questions from the board for Mike? Appears not. I would like to make a statement. <laughs> <laughs> it has been an absolute pleasure to work with you, Mike. It, it absolutely has. And uh, the time has gone quickly. We understand that uh, in the auditing procedures, they change auditors just, for con just to make sure we're all doing everything right. Okay. But uh, it's been great to work with you. Uh, it really has, and we as a board uh, really appreciate all that you've done, and the, it's been a pleasure to be with you. Uh, thank you. That was very kind, and, and likewise, it's been a, a pleasure to, to be connected to this organization, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I want to reflect your comments, Dr. Seward. You know, um, Mike has been with us for 11 years now, and um, we're really sorry to see him go. Mike is everything that you want in an auditor. He's knowledgeable really knowledgeable um, he's tough uh, he's fair he's collaborative uh, and it's been a, a really great partnership he and his team 
uh, uh, under Mike's guidance, have done really good audits. And you know, uh, even when we've had small issues, um, you know, that was the result of the quality of Mike's audits. And so, I want to thank Mike for 11 years of service to us. And um, we're just sorry to see you go. Yeah. <laughs> I also want to acknowledge some other folks who participated in this. This is, you know, uh, a lot of work, and I think we're blessed to have a team that embraces the idea of gap and of internal control and make sure that the outcome of our audits are just what you saw today. And so I want to thank Dan Nardoni um, uh, at WTMF. I want to thank Sandy Bemis, our controller uh, for the hospital. I want to thank Erica Luna, our uh, assistant CFO, and um, Dave Tapia, who is our director of, of accounting, but absent, um, uh, I want to thank as well. They really, really take this seriously and really pay attention to what they're doing. So um, thank you to you guys, too. Thank you, Chris. Thank you again, Mike. Thanks. It's truly, truly been a good time. Uh, and along with that, I'm going to take the action item uh, for the acceptance of the audit out of order and do that at this point in time. Uh, if I could get a motion on that. Yes, Mr. President, I move uh, regarding item A, audit review, uh, excuse me, audit report for fiscal year ending June 30th, 2019. Mr. President, I move for acceptance of the audit report for fiscal year ending June 30th, 2019 as presented and that the secretary be directed to publish the report in accordance with applicable law and hospital policies and procedures. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on that? Seeing none, uh, Dave, you take the roll. Director Stewart. Aye. Director Nicholson. Aye. Director Wallace. Aye. Director Epen. Aye. Director Yee. Aye. Great. That motion passes. And uh, again, we'd like to thank uh, Mike McBride for all his work in the, in the last 11 years. It's hard for me to understand how he looks so young. <laughs> Maybe it's your eyesight. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <Mike. laughs> it could well be my eyesight. Uh, I'd prefer to give the give the confidence to Mike. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're moving on now to uh, item six. We'd like to hear from the service reports. Our service league report from Ruth. Good evening. So um, tonight, I just want to take the opportunity to say that the volunteers really appreciate the opportunity that the organization has given us to help the um, Tooth of Whistle Washington Hospital. And in doing so, we wanted to talk specifically about two volunteers. Each month, we look at how many hours or how many years we've had volunteers to be with us and serving here as volunteers. So this year in our report, we have one person named Guthrie Barton, who has worked 45 years as a volunteer. So oftentimes, we measure their in hours. Uh, for Guthrie, we measure hers in years, and she's up to 45 years. So I think that's outstanding as a commitment to the volunteer organization. And then our second person is Charlie Rosari. Charlie works on Mondays and Fridays in the afternoon in the, at the hospital lobby and very dedicated. So recently, Charlie celebrated his 96th birthday. And so he's still here. He loves being a volunteer and he's been here for 20 years. So that just speaks to the volume and the type of volunteers that we have here at the organization. And I just felt that we should know that we have such commitment from different people and Charlie was very surprised but concierge really wanted to do something for him and that was Dee, Brenda and Matt and so we chipped right in and said let's celebrate Charlie 96 years of age and 20 years of service. Thank you Ruth. 96. 96. Mm -hmm. Well see Mike. And he's growing strong. I mean he's strong. <laughs> yeah. He's good. I got something to do when I turn 70. There you go. <laughs> Medical staff report from uh, Dr. Killaroo. Thank you. We have a total of uh, 583 members, out of which 362 are active medical staff. Uh, now we'll move to our hospital events report uh, from Kimberly Hartz, our CEO. Well, we start with the, the calendar.
past health promotions and outreach events. On Thursday, September 12th, Dr. Timothy Ortlip, ear, nose, and throat specialist, presented Suffer from Sinus Problems? 18 people attended. On Tuesday, September 17th, Dr. Jennifer Chan, thoracic surgery, presented Learn the Latest Treatment Options for Gastroesophageal Reflux Disease, GERD. 27 people attended. On Wednesday, September 18th, Christy Caracappa, Health Insurance Information Service Coordinator, presented New to Medicare, What You Need to Know. 48 people attended. Some of our tiniest patients spend time in the special care nursery before they go home. While there, they may meet several members of our staff, physicians, nurses, unit clerks, EVS staff, volunteer cuddlers, and respiratory care therapists. On Saturday, September 21st, 36 families attended the special care nursery reunion and enjoyed games, treats, photos, and lots of hugs. It was a special opportunity for staff members to reconnect with the babies, their families, and siblings, all of whom become a part of the special care nursery family. On Sunday, September 22nd, Washington Hospital staff provided information on health-related programs and services during the Community Information Fair at the City of Newark's 64th Annual Newark Days Celebration. More than 100 people visited the health information booth. On Thursday, September 26th, Washington Hospital and Washington Township Medical Foundation staff participated in the City of Fremont Employee Health Fair. Staff provided health education along with glucose, cholesterol, and blood pressure screenings. More than 300 people attended the event. 66 glucose and cholesterol screenings were provided. 63 blood pressure screenings were provided. Also on Thursday, September 26, Dr. Victoria Leapart presented Healthy Gut, Healthy You. 42 people attended. On Saturday, September 28, Washington Hospital and Washington Township Medical Foundation staffed an information booth at the HERS Breast Cancer Foundation Keep a Breast 5 and 10K Walk Run event at Quarry Lakes in Fremont. Staff provided health information and massages. The event raised funds for breast cancer programs and services. Washington Hospital was a sponsor. More than 500 people participated in the event. On Monday, September 30th, as part of the Speakers Bureau, Christy Caracappa provided an overview of the Health Insurance Information Service in addition to wellness programs during the Community Ambassadors for Seniors CAPS training program. 72 people attended. On Tuesday, October 1st, Christy Caracappa presented Medicare Open Enrollment, What You Need to Know. 26 people attended. On Thursday, October 3rd, as part of the Diabetes Matters program, Anna Maze, RD, presented Asian Fusion. This presentation explored modifying traditional recipes to make them healthier without losing their distinctive flavors. 10 people attended. On Tuesday, October 8th, as part of the Stroke Education Series, Maria Nunez, RN, presented Stroke Prevention. 10 people attended. Upcoming health promotions and community outreach events. On Monday, October 14th, from 6.30 to 8 p.m., as part of the Women's Health Strategies for Wellness series, Kimberly Alvari, Director of Food and Clinical Nutrition Services, and Sherry Plaza, Washington Wellness Center Yoga Instructor, will present Healthy Eating, Active Living. On Tuesday, October 15th, from 10 a.m. to noon, as part of the Stroke Education Series, Melissa Reyes will present Life After a Stroke. On Thursday, October 17th, from 5 to 7.30 p.m., Washington Hospital will host the annual Think Pink Breast Health Awareness Event. The event will feature a health fair and presentations by Dr. William Dagoni, General Surgeon and Medical Director of the Women's Center, Dr. Emmy Yoshida, Radiation Oncologist and Medical Director of the Washington Radiation Oncology Center, and Anjali Rao, Washington Wellness Center Yoga Instructor. Dr. Victoria Leapart will emcee the event. Call 510-818-7301 to register or for more information. On Thursday, October 24th, from 6 to 8 p.m., at the Washington Township Medical Foundation, Danielson Clinic, Newark Conference Room, Dr. Nancy Stoll, Family Medicine, will present Overcoming Obesity. On Saturday, October 26th, from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., Washington Hospital will host the biannual Children's Health and Safety Fair. 
This free interactive event will provide health and safety information for families. It will also feature the popular Teddy Bear Clinic, staffed by Washington Township Medical Foundation. The Teddy Bear Clinic allows children to bring their favorite stuffed animal for a checkup. This event is co-sponsored by UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital, Washington Township Medical Foundation, and the Washington Hospital Employee Association. On Monday, October 28th, from 6.30 to 8 p.m., as part of the Women's Health Strategies for Wellness series, Dr. Katherine Dow, Cardiology, will present Gender Matters, Heart Disease Risk in Women. On Wednesday, October 30th, from 3 to 5 p.m., Dr. Eldon Eichbaum, Neurosurgery, will present Sideline by Back Pain, Get Back in the Game. On Saturday, November 2nd, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., Washington Hospital will host the annual Abdominal Aortic Aneurysm Screening. Aneurysms develop over time and may have no symptoms, but if one bursts, it can cause immediate and life-threatening symptoms. Dr. Gabriel Herskew, vascular and endovascular surgeon, and vascular surgeons Dr. John Thomas Mahegan and Dr. Sarah Wartman will be on hand to interpret screening results. This event is co-sponsored by the Fremont Bank Foundation. To register, call 800 963-7070. On Tuesday, November 5th, from 3 to 5 p.m., Dr. Jennifer Chan, Thoracic Surgery, will present Advancements in Lung Cancer Detection and Treatment. On Saturday, November 9th, from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., Washington Hospital will host the annual Diabetes Awareness Health Fair. The event will begin with a health fair from 9 to 10.30 a.m. The health fair will include blood glucose, cholesterol, and blood pressure screenings in addition to diabetic foot exams. There will be three speaker presentations from 10.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. Dr. Prasad Kata, endocrinologist, will present standards of medical care in diabetes. Dr. Jack Rose, neurointensivist, and Luan Sadweste, RN, will co-present diabetes and stroke. What is the connection? and Dr. Amir Dashka, podiatrist, will present Diabetes and Foot Care. To register, call 800-963-7070. On Tuesday, November 12th, from 6 to 8 p.m., Dr. Seema Segal, psychiatry, will present Anxiety, Stop Negative Thoughts. Bay Area Healthier Together. Washington Hospital's partnership with ABC7 continues to provide health-related information and education through on-air programming and on BayAreaHealthierTogether.com. The featured topic during the month of September was Washington Hospital's Birthing Center, featuring OBGYN Stacy McDonald, MD, and several other physicians from the Washington Township Medical Foundation's Women's Health Specialist Clinic, plus articles on breastfeeding and preparing for birth. The Washington Hospital Healthcare Foundation Report. On Saturday, October 12th, the Washington Hospital Healthcare Foundation will host the 33rd annual Top Hat Dinner Dance. This year's co chairs, City of Fremont Chief of Police Kimberly Peterson and Drs. Rohit and Seema Sagal, promise a wonderful evening of fine dining and lively entertainment. Proceeds from the evening will benefit Washington Hospital Women's Center with the purchase of 3D mammography equipment. This cutting-edge technology has been proven to produce clear diagnostic images, making it easier for physicians to detect abnormalities, reducing instances of false positives and unnecessary biopsies. Guests can purchase individual tickets or tables of 10. The Foundation also welcomes new and returning sponsors to the gala. To reserve seats at Top Hat or inquire about sponsorship opportunities, please call the Foundation at 510-818-7350. Washington on Wheels WOW Mobile Health Clinic The Washington on Wheels Mobile Health Clinic WOW is a mobile medical unit providing quality health care services primarily to uninsured and underserved district residents. WOW brings Washington Hospital's commitment to patient-first care to clients throughout the district. During the month of September, WOW served community members at the following locations. In Fremont, the Family Resource Center, Bay Area Community Services, BAX, TCV Food Bank and Thrift Store, and the Irvington Presbyterian Church. In Union City, the Ruggieri Senior Center, Alvarado Resource Center, and Our Lady of the Rosary Church. In Newark, Solid Rock Community Services. 
These community partners provide social services to families in need and the homeless population. WOW provided occupational health services including influenza vaccines at Materion, a Fremont company specializing in high-performance engineered materials and California Brazing, a manufacturing company focused in heating and thermal management for the development of metal and ceramic parts. WOW also provided first aid support during the HERS Breast Cancer Foundation Keep a Breast 5 and 10K Walk Run event at Quarry Lakes in Fremont. The total number of community members receiving health care from the Washington on Wheels Mobile Health Clinic during the month of September was 126. Internet and Social Media Marketing Washington Hospital's website serves as a central source of information. The hospital's employment section was September's most viewed webpage with 37,005 views. Washington Hospital has an active social media presence. Through these channels, we update the community with news on events, services, and patient care. Connecting with our community through social media continues to grow. Our social media channels in September presented several important features to the community. This content ranged from information on Alameda County cooling centers to a prestigious recognition for our maternal child health program. One of our top social media moments focused on families and staff attending our annual Washington Special Care Nursery Graduates Reunion. Users can find us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Washington Hosp. In Health, Channel 78. During the month of August, Washington Hospital's cable channel 78 In Health captured new programming including three health and wellness programs titled Suffer from Sinus Problems, Learn the Latest Treatment Options for Gastroesophageal Reflux Disease, GERD, and Healthy Gut, Healthy You, and two Women's Health Strategies for Wellness series programs called Women's Health Through the Years, Screening's Key to Aging Well, and Reproductive Health, Planning for Pregnancy. In addition, InHealth aired a health and wellness program called Laugh Without Leaking, Understanding Urinary Incontinence, a women's health strategies for wellness series program titled Depression, More Than a State of Mind, and the September Board of Directors Meeting. For more information on any of the programs mentioned, visit whhs.com or call 800-963-7070 and please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. So um, just before I do the Employee of the Month for October, I do just want to say a couple of words about um, the PG&E potential power outage. I think we're all aware that PG&E is in the process of conducting public safety power shutoffs. And as we know, it's going to potentially affect hundreds of thousands of people in northern and central uh, California. And it does include some of the neighborhoods in Washington Township Healthcare District. So it is important that the community knows that, that Washington is prepared. At this point, um, it does on PG&E, they have put out a map um, as to the areas that are potentially impacted. And Washington Hospital is not in that. But we also know that you we never know how that could, could change those boundaries. So um, it is important that our community knows that you know we, we will be open and that if there are any appointments, they should um, c uh, come to those unless that uh, we do notify them. And in the event of a power loss, it's also uh, to know that we have emergency generators so that we will be fully functional as a hospital. Our main building, our pavilion, um, our um, also our center for joint replacement. And if you know, we built the center, the uh, central utility plant, which is home to our emergency generators, and the community helped to support that, and that we can fully function as um, a healthcare system providing that inpatient care. So I just think it's important that our, our community is aware and that we're going to continue to monitor PG&E, and we do send out notices via um, social media and if there's anything more that, that we find out. But um, I know that there's a, that's a, on the minds of a lot of our community, and it is important as a, as a community hospital that they know that we are here um, to provide care. So, all right, uh, now moving on to the October Employee of the Month, Elisa 
Tai Da Tai Da Wei. Um, she's a journey. She is a pharmacy technician, and Elisa's journey into the healthcare industry began right out of high school when she became an emergency department admissions clerk at St. Rose Hospital. The Hayward native immediately knew that a career that focuses on helping others was the right fit for her. She decided to pursue a pharmacy technician role and joined the Washington Hospital family in 2013. One of her core values focuses on work ethic. She believes that work ethic is a direct reflection on a person's character. That may be why the director of pharmacy, Mintu Denon, describes Elisa as dependable, efficient, with excellent follow through on projects. Mintu notes she's a good team player with strong leadership skills. Elisa is detail oriented and very organized. Elisa's skills were particularly valuable while working on the large product of, project of implementing the Pixis build and expansion to the Morse Hyman Critical Care Pavilion. More than 12 new Pixis stations needed to be created and exact detail was critical. She played a key role in the success of this project. Elisa's desire to help others is part of her family culture. Her parents came to the U.S. mainland from Guam. One of the core values of the Chamorro fam people and family is doing good for others, and that concept extends to the community. When not at Washington Hospital, Elisa spends time with her large and very close family. Their celebrations may include attending Pacific Island festivals or enjoying large barbecues with cultural food such as red rice and a dish that is similar to ceviche. Elisa has a seven-year-old daughter and a seven-month-old boy. Elisa's dedication to her family, her co-workers, and the patients at Washington Hospital all contribute to her being our October Employee of the Month. Thank you, everybody. We'd like now to have our lean report, uh, Christine Santos. Yes, I have now. two people that I would like to introduce um, tonight. The first is uh, Krishan Kumar. Krishan was born in the Fiji Islands, has been a resident of Hayward for the last 27 years. He is married with three children. Krishan has been working at Washington in the sterile processing department in various roles for 24 years. He has been SPD manager for the last five years and obtained certification at the manager level from his professional organization. In his spare time, Krishan enjoys watching professional soccer and spending time with his large extended family. The next person I'd like to introduce is uh, Christine Santos. Christine was born in San Francisco and has lived in Hayward for 17 years. She is married with two children. Her husband, Anthony, is also employed by Washington as a storekeeper. Christine has been at Washington for six years, four in SPD, and the last two as SPD coordinator. She has a degree in electronic engineering and also a certified SPD technician. In her spare time, Christine enjoys playing a number of sports, including basketball, volleyball, and softball. She also spends time with her family, taking her children to their sporting events. So I'd like to invite the two of you to come up and present um, the presentation on, um, on the central um, sterile processing department. Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, good, e good evening, all. So this evening, I'm going to walk you through the early concepts of our lean leadership, our lean journey in sterile processing. Now, before I share our results of our, new, of our lean leadership development, some may ask, what is sterile processing? What do we do there? So sterile processing is referred to as the heart of the hospital. And just as the heart is the main pump supply, supplying the body with its vital nutrients, Sterile processing does the same function as supplying its vital supplies for patient care. Our sterile processing team is made up of 16 certified sterile processing, sterile processing technicians who operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We are responsible for cleaning, decontaminating, processing, assembling, sterilizing, testing, and otherwise managing the instruments for patient care, especially the ones for surgery. We also pick up, clean, and redistribute patient equipment such as the IV pump, the feeding pump, the air mattress pump, and uh, many more just to name a few. Sterile processing technicians pick and stage an average of 22 case carts for an average, pick an average of 22 case carts for the next day's surgery. 
A case cart is a cart that is supplied with items designated for a single surgical procedure and transported to the operating room. In addition, we supply and maintain about 65 adult crash carts, five pediatric and five neonatal crash carts throughout the facility. Each drawer has a specific list of supplies to stock when there's an emergency. And whenever a crash cart is used, we replenish them when the items are opened. Not only do we reprocess the C-section instruments, but we pick and stage the supplies so the case cart is ready when needed. But our services don't stop with the operating room. We provide services to many departments throughout the organization. So tonight, we'll, I'll be discussing three improvement opportunities, um, one being the 5S process, TDOC implementation, and communication within our department. So this is, a sterile proce this is sterile processing before the 5S workshop. And as you can see, this is cramped with a lot of carts. And although the carts are neat and organized, the, the supplies weren't placed to make the case cart picking efficient. As a result of our 5S improvement process, we now have a brighter workspace. And by reorganizing the supply carts, this allowed more space in the high traffic areas. We also grouped many supply carts. We grouped the supply carts according to specialty. So as you can see, we placed all the service line supplies together to reduce the amount of time it takes to pull a case cart. For example, the orthopedic case cart picking, we reduced the time from 5 minutes 55 seconds to 3 minutes 54 seconds. And our motion was cut down from 792 steps to 94 steps. This reduction in time and motion happened across all service lines. After we reorganized the supplies for group picking, we improved the process. So we didn't stop there. So first, before, we had the preference card automatically printed out. Now, what is a preference card? It's like a recipe. So a recipe has a list of ingredients and some instructions on how to make a dish. So like a recipe, a preference card is instructions, is a set of instructions for a particular surgery, including a list of supplies and equipment required. So once that printed out, some of the supplies, we looked at the supplies, and some of the supplies listed on the preference card are located in the operating room and the other supplies are located in sterile processing. So the, the text, sterile processing text would have to go through the list and highlight all the supplies that are carried in sterile processing. Next, the sterile processing technician went in, um, manually issued out the supplies using the material management system. And finally, the, the supplies, we were able to pick the supplies. Now, after the preference card is automatically printed, with the help of the IT, with IT, each preference card has its unique case ID. So the tech would go into the materials management system, click on the case ID they needed, and a case card, a, a pick ticket would automatically print, and we would just print, pick the items. This improvement cut our process time in half. So now I'd like to cover our main responsibility in sterilization, which is sterilization. So once the surgery is done, the instruments are sent down to sterile processing in the decontamination side. Here, the techs will clean off any blood and bio burdens from the instruments. We then place the instruments in the washer for a high level disinfecting, similar to your dishwashers at home. After cleaning in the prep and pack, we inspect and assembled the trays and organize them um, and organize and and tray and organize them in a good manner. Once the tray is assembled, we put them through sterilization. After the instruments are cool to touch, they are brought to the OR for storage. Now, before instrument tracking, this was a manual process. It was very difficult to track, and there's no chain of custody. Now, with instrument tracking, we're able to computerize the process and can follow the chain of custody at every step. And because our equipment like the washer and the sterilizer are tied to the instrument tracking system, we are also able to tighten our record keeping. So in decontamination, 
Instrument tracking allows us to monitor each tray going through the washer and making sure that it meets the washer's preset temperature. And this is automatically recorded. So if we needed to pull it up in, in the future, we had it. After the instruments came out of the washer, the instruments are usually unorganized. So instrument tracking enabled us to provide a list of instruments for each tray to organize in a specific order and even show pictures of the instruments. During the sterilization process, instrument tracking helped us help the technicians monitor each tray in meeting the required time and temperature and again automatically documented that into the system. So instrument tracking closes the chain of custody when the OR staff scans the tray into the instrument room. Now the tray is ready for the next case. One of the other safety features that instrument tracking provides are triggers for one-of-a-kind one items. Now what is one-of-a-kind items? These are um, items that are specialty trays that we only have one of and we might need it later on in the day. So these trays are flagged in red and show up on the board as a priority tray so that the techs know to work on those trays first. Instrument tracking provides reminders at every at, of the priority trays at every scanning point there is. Now I'll turn the mic over to Krishan who will explain about our communication in the department. Thank you, Christine. Um, the board, the left board is our process on a board. As Christine mentioned, all of the metrics and accomplishments on lean projects, we track them on this board. We also use this process on a board to communicate with our management staff and our staff to oversee how well we are progressing in these projects. The board on the right is our stroke processing frontline board. This gives us an opportunity for the staff to discuss any issues or improvement ideas they may have. As quality is at our forefront of our department, just as a, just as a construction site would advertise how many days they have gone without injury, we also track how many days we have gone without errors in, our, in a tray. In an event of an error, this is also the time where we re-educate our staff. The, our third board is our newest addition to the department and it is used to improve communication. Staff makes daily equipment rounds throughout the pavilion and the main hospital and they indicate on the board the last time they made equipment rounds. Sometimes surgeon needs specific trays for certain cases that do not belong to the hospital and they come to the hospital as a loaner trays. This information is communicated on this board so we are well all on the same page. We also communicate turnover trays for the day. For example, we may have five knee sets but we are performing six knee cases in a day. So stroke processing would need to process one set of knee trays as a turnover. In conclusion, in 5S, we have reduced steps in time for picking all case cards, reduced ortho case card picking steps by 88%, and estimated time saving across all cases is over 160 hours. With lean initiatives, the department took upon themselves as a 5S process in prep and pack area where they initiated it in lean process while uh, for assembling instrument trays. For TDOC implementation, we are well documented chain of custody of trays, automated record keeping, minimized delay time in locating trays in the operating room. As communicating in huddles and information boards, our communication is our daily priorities. We close communication gap between shifts. Uh, these advances and preparations have not only made stroke processing more efficient, but have also improved patient safety. Next week is sterile processing week. Please remember to give a SPD tech a pat on the back. Without their tireless efforts, other departments in the hospital won't be able to carry out their life-saving roles. Thank you. Very, very fun to see that kind of results. 88% drop in uh, the picking. That's remarkable. How long, do, how long does that normally take? before the 88% drop? Mm. The usual drop case cart picking? Or well, the 88% 88, uh, 88 was in the, the motion. Um, and so 
prior to the 5S, it's, the supplies, although like you saw, it was neat, they weren't grouped in their service lines. So the techs would have to go all over the department. And so by doing the 5S and grouping them through service lines, it's very quick and less steps. Usually, depending on who picks it and how long their legs are, it could be even <laughs> less than that. We, yeah. we have to stay focused. So we have a couple of people who have long legs. So we, we try to stay standardized and we focus only on those people. So. <laughs> very good. Any other questions from the board? Thank you again. That was Thank very you. fascinating. Thank you. We're now ready for our quality report uh, from Mary Boron. Good evening. Um, tonight I want to share with you um, some uh, initiatives that patient safety has been working on in the hospital with um, a couple of our, our departments in the hospital, the ED and OB, working in collaboration with BETA. And BETA is our local um, hospital insurance carrier. And what I think is great about this program and beta collaborating with us is that instead of just focusing on, you know, sort of the, the sort of boring and, and bureaucratic details of insurance, they've, they've actually come together and we've established a great relationship with them over time that's focused on improving quality and patient safety. So tonight we'll be hearing a couple of the areas that they have uh, worked with us on over the years. Um, beta has a tier system model and approach to how they help hospitals collaborate to improve patient safety. Uh, they focus on tier one, which is really focusing on education, providing individual participants insight to their own personal knowledge. These are like employees from all different disciplines, you know, doctors, nurses, and helping the employee understand what's your current baseline knowledge of the area of risk we're studying and um, helping them get educated to where they are prepared to work, walk into tier two. And tier two focuses on um, helping the hospital as a team come up with options that set priorities based on what we've identified as maybe a risk trend in our area and working with the medical group and the staff to establish a program and overall process improvement that will ultimately reduce the risk in these areas. Um, this is all done in the name of Quest for Zero. And Quest for Zero is really to, um, getting the hospital to having zero events that are related to any unanticipated um, harm or injury that may occur to the patient. So the overall idea is get down to zero events and therefore improve the quality of patients that the um, care that the patients have. Uh, this uh, collaborative relationship was introduced to the emergency department in, as far back as 2011 and um, was expanded to OB soon after in 2012. Um, as I said, they participate with the hospital on um, all levels of the team in the healthcare system. Uh, Beta is very uh, strict on assuring that if you really want to change and improve patient safety, you have to have everybody on board. You have to have 100% participation. This requires 100% um, of the physicians, um, nursing, and any other skill sets that are involved in whatever the initiative is have to come to the table and meet 100% of the standard, which leads to overall enhanced skills and knowledge and improved communication across the department. So it, the, the more detail of their program structure is that they use an e-learning format and the tier one that I referred to earlier. And each, each person who's participating has to go through model uh, modules and complete all of that so that they um, can get through and build the foundation for their personalized le uh, learning plan. And then that steps into tier two, which is really the building block. So how are you gonna take this knowledge that you know the staff has and apply it to improving process in the hospital that will reduce risk? And um, that includes things like um, doing sim simulations, doing drills, focusing on medication safety, what can we do to improve that? And overall creating a culture of safety. A lot of what you hear with these initiatives is focused on communication and that comes um, when you have a good, strong culture of safety that they help and support us in building. Um, and 
The um, areas of focus uh, in our hospital have been uh, emergency department and obstetrics. So I'm gonna start with the emergency department's quest for zero. So again, working towards getting to where there are zero events that, um, put pa that have put patients at risk for harm. Um, our, uh, so far to date, since we've participated in, in 2011, we have um, 80 uh, of the ED nurses trained, 21 physicians. I actually um, was speaking earlier with the medical director of the ED, and he uh, was saying that you know getting this large group of people on board and getting having the entire staff and everybody you're working with in the emergency department under the standardized training and participation, you can just see the wave of how it's improved communication across the department. And I was happy to hear that. Um, and it's we are one of 24 hospitals that have had this uh, accomplishment of 100% participation. And it really shows the commitment to safety and improving quality care. So tier one in the ED in um, 2018 and 2019 has been um, focused on communication. And this is you know, one of the oldest national patient safety goals. It's patient safety goal number two, and it's really improving communication um, because we know that that is where 80% of medical errors um, happen and beta has been able to um, give us some data that says 30% you know, of malpractice cases are associated with key. Uh, the key factor that falls out is people not communicating correctly. Um, and so they did a case study approach and the, the strategic approach they use with tier one learning is getting people to understand a common language, right? Are we using the same terms that mean the same thing? So if I use a word and I'm describing something in the middle of a code or an emergency situation, is the person I'm working with understanding it in the same way? Do we agree that when I use this word, it's the standard language that we understand? That's that's um, a big part of the focus to improving it. And, and a shared mental model, what basically means, do we both understand the same situation in the same way? Because when we know that we're working with the same things, we can make the same interventions at the same time and have better outcomes. And so it's really building that standard clear communication uh, is a big part of the technique. And again, once you know that everybody is on board using this standard form of communication and approach, uh, the ED um, working with their um, CNS, Betty Goodwin, and the uh, lead ED physician on this, Leif Erickson, uh, they're able to come up with a toolkit approach um, to looking at, in this specific example this year, it was based on surge planning. And I can't think of a, a better time to be focusing on surge planning. You know, we've, we all know that there's a lot of um, unknown pathogens that can that can outbreak at any time in the hospital. We know that there's been incidences that have increased, you know, with related to violence or shootings or things like that that we all hear about. So surges can happen at any time in the hospital. It's really important that we're prepared, especially in the ED setting, to take the capacity. So I think it's a great time for the ED to be focusing on that as a patient safety initiative. Um, and one of the things that they've done is they in, um, in, implemented a tool called uh, any doc and it's the emergency department overcrowding score so you can actually go in and calculate the um, a risk of a surge and allocate appropriate resources as you're moving through it instead of everybody scrambling and finding out how many of this discipline do I need um, am I getting closer to a surge because you can't see that overall picture when you're each working individually in the department so I think that tool is a great thing to help them uh, assess their how close they are to capacity and what resources they need to change quickly to make sure that patients can get the care that they need. Um, and so moving on to the next area of risk is obstetrics, uh, otherwise known as OB. Uh, I think that we all understand that, um, you know, majority of the time things go great there. But it is, it is an environment where you have to be prepared for if an event happens, um, you have to be able to recognize what was your risk, how can you mitigate that risk, because it is such an important department where we absolutely want to mitigate the risk to as low as possible um, because of the fact that you know births occur there. So in our hospital, um, we've been participating since 2012. Uh, that's a total of 50 OB nurses have participated and 20 of the OBGYN uh, practitioners. Um, also, again, this, this um, has led to 100% participation in that area, getting us the recognition of being one of 24 hospitals in California that have led to 100% participation. 
So in tier one uh, learning for this group, uh, they focused on the fetal assessment and monitoring, really important obviously um, to be able to monitor the baby um, appropriately and make sure that it's being done in a standard way for um, all patients. And um, basically they have had um, an annual demonstration of maintenance and improvement in knowledge and judgment compared to peers from other beta health group sites um, and been able to get that feedback from beta. and. We have, as a result, um, performed in the top quartile for RNs to sustain and improve their knowledge annually. So I think that's really good for the level of knowledge that you can expect for your OB nurses there. And tier two, um, taking that to the next step, again, this is the building block. So what, what are we doing to build a process and a supportive structure in OB that reduces risk to patients? And one of the ways is participating into our California Maternal Quality Care Collaborative. Um, and this is the focus with pa participating in this collaborative right now in 2018-19 has been reducing the primary uh, cesarean birth rate. And so, of course, um, anytime you want to have a you know a standard vaginal birth with babies, uh, but especially on your first, it's it's important that if you can avoid a cesarean, and of course, if it's medically necessary, do it for the safety of the baby and the mother, but um, you want to reduce the risk if, um, if you can for that mother. So that's been a big focus and um, building a structure further by developing and participating with other collaboratives like the Perinative Safety Collaborative that we've also been participating in. So moving forward, in, um, we, we of course will continue to show commitment to patient safety. We we'll continue to work with beta and some of the areas and the two tiers that we'll be focusing on um, and, and have already started on and will continue through 2020 are modules on sepsis. Um, we see a lot of sepsis um, here in the hospital and getting the ED to have a standard education and approach to how we identify sepsis early and intervene on it will help reduce mortality and morbidity for patients and OB will continue to focus on the fetal monitoring and assessment. And tier two um, will participate in the emergency medical council to develop what will probably be another sepsis toolkit because toolkits have worked really well because they've had a standard format and approach and people are familiar with them. And the OB group will continue to participate in the perinatal safety collaborative um, with actually with the focus on sepsis also and continuing to make sure that um, in the second year we focus on keeping that cesarean rate low for mothers of delivering first time babies. Um, this is a very high level overview to what we've done here for Quest for Zero. Um, I cannot begin to emphasize the labor and workload and organization that uh, is included in this to get people to um, come together in a right time and a place and get educated and, and be able to improve process. So we've, uh, like I said, it's done, it's great to have beta as a source that we can be working on collaboratively with. Um, and as a result of this hard work and uh, organization that I know uh, has been led here a lot by the um, administrative team, uh, having the vision and knowing that we need to continue to participate in this program. Uh, we have actually been given some statewide recognition award from BETA. In fact, uh, right up to last week, if you'll see over there, uh, we received another two of those beautiful glass um, awards for our participation in tier two, and that's in OB and ED. So I think that really demonstrates that we have had overall improved um, knowledge and that we're getting a great um, impact out of that with the patients and the care that we give. Thank you. Great. Congratulations. Yes, thank you. Those yes. are beautiful, uh, beautiful awards, yeah. but they mean a lot. They do. Yeah, it's, that's what I was thinking. They represent a lot of effort and collaboration for a program. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mary. We're now ready for our uh, finance report from Chris Henry. Thanks, Dr. Stewart. Um, tonight we'll be looking at Washington Hospital's operating and financial results for August 2019. Um, volumes overall pretty strong. Um, average daily census for the month was 8.5 above budget at 162.5. Um, admissions, as we discussed last month, were right on budget at uh, 969. Patient days for the month were 263 above budget at 5,037. 
uh, we had 194 outpatient uh, uh, observation equivalent days for the month. Uh, that was 26 above the budget. And our average length of stay for the month um, was higher than we expected at 5.45. We'd expected 4.93 days. Um, looking at utilization, case mix index for the month, uh, again, was a little higher than budget. Uh, that, that is the indicator of the severity of the cases we saw in the month. It came in at 1.498. Uh, deliveries were four above budget in August at 144. Uh, surgical cases, likewise, were three above budget at 390. That includes our joint replacement cases that were four below budget at 135. Neurosurgical cases, just one below budget at 20. Uh, cardiac surgical cases, three above budget at 13. And uh, we had 514 cath lab procedures in August. We'd expected 360. So you know, the majority of those came uh, in vascular and non-vascular procedures. Um, outpatient visits for the month continued to be high, 507 above budget at 8,185. Uh, and emergency room visits came pretty close to budget at 4,252 visits. Uh, as I mentioned, um, uh, peripheral vascular procedures really dominated the mix in the cath lab for the month, 53% of the volume. We have two uh, uh, physicians who have gotten very busy um, uh, in there. Cardiac uh, procedures made up 25% of the activity for the month followed by non-vascular interventional radiology at 21%. Um, moving into productivity, productive FTEs for August uh, uh, were 82.7 above the budget at 1,348.6. We had 179.9 non-productive FTEs. That was 9.5 below budget, I think, because of the volumes people were here working and, and not taking time off. So we ended the month uh, with total FTEs that were 73.2 uh, above the budget at 1,528.5. Our uh, full-time equivalents per adjusted occupied bed, which is our productivity measure, came in a little bit over budget at 6.53. Now moving into the numbers, all that activity actually turned into some pretty good gross revenue. Um, gross revenue for the month came in uh, almost seven, well, a little over $7.6 million above the budget at 181,818, excuse me, 181,818, a lot of ones and eights in there, $818,000. Um, uh, our, our contractuals for the month came in almost right on budget, but you got to see the detail to really understand what was going on in there. Um, uh, for our insured patients, our contractual allowances um, actually came in 3.5% above the budget uh, at $135,661,000. And that's favorable to us since gross revenue grew 4.4%. You would expect that your contractuals would grow along with it. They only grew 3.5%, and that amounted to a, a, an advantage to us of about 1.1 million. However, bad debt did the exact opposite thing for the month. Um, our uh, provisions for bad debt and charity um, uh, were 31.5% above the budget at uh, $5,425,000. That also equated to uh, a take back of 1.1 million. And that's how we got really to, to budget uh, in our write-offs for the month. Um, uh, operating expenses for the month uh, came in $3 million above the budget at $42,474,000. Really three main drivers going on here. Uh, our salaries and wages with our higher FTEs um, were about $991,000 above the budget. Um, really, the, the big uh, issue here for the month was our Blue Shield claims. Our Blue Shield claims for the month came in at $4.6 million against a budget of $3.4 million. Um, we, you know, that kind of raised some flags for us when we started digging into this. Um, it is uh, likely the highest month of claims that we've ever seen. Uh, I had the staff go back uh, a number of years. The closest number they could find to this ha occurred back in 2016 at 3.9 million. Um, 
So then I started looking at the number of claims. Let's see, let's see what's going on there. On average, over the last 12 months, we've seen about 1,114 claims a month. This month was 1,122, so it wasn't claims volume. Um, then we started looking at dollars, and um, of that 4.5 million, uh, we had 16 claims that were greater than $50,000, including one that was a half a million dollars. Those 16 claims amounted to $2 million of the $4.5 million. And I took it down another tier and looked at claims between uh, $10,000 and $50,000. We had 51 claims in that category that amounted to another uh, uh, million dollars. So of the 1,122 claims, we had 67 claims that amounted to 66% of our expense for the month. It's a, a lot of high dollar claims. Uh, we started looking at some of the details. We have some pretty complex things going on uh, on some of these claims, um, and j we're just seeing expensive care right now for, for our employees. So um, we're going to keep a close eye on it, um, uh, and hopefully won't continue to see this level of claims moving on through the year. But uh, that's how it kind of sliced, uh, sliced and diced. Um, so the other uh, issue uh, with the expenses this month was um, our supplies. They were $732,000 above budget. Um, about half of that came from um, uh, our drugs. Uh, our infusion center uh, volume was 97 visits above the budget, and those cancer drugs are very expensive. And that really drove uh, about $315,000 of the supplies variance for the month. The rest of it uh, came from prosthesis and cardiac and neuro supplies for the month. Um, so we ended the month um, uh, with an operating loss of about a million two uh, in August. Non-operating income uh, uh, had a good result for the month. Um, we did have an unrealized gain uh, on our investments of almost a million one uh, and a realized gain uh, of $314,000. So we end the month with uh, non-operating income of a million five and a total bottom line about $274,000 above the budget uh, at $309,000. And this is our Governmental Accounting Standards Board presentation, uh, which is the presentation we use for the audit uh, that you just saw. Um, looking at our Financial Accounting Standards Board, uh, we move uh, the interest expense on our revenue bonds back up into operating uh, expenses out of non-operating. Um, and we eliminate our tax revenue and related interest for our GO bonds um, uh, and that unrealized gain in our investments to come up with non-operating income of $867,000 and an operating loss of a uh, little over $1.9 million and a total bottom line from a FASB perspective uh, with a loss of about $1.1 million. Take a quick look at uh, our earnings before interest, uh, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, and that is a mouthful every time I say it. Um, uh, and at the risk of being repetitive, I just want to remind folks, the reason we look at this is we want to see how much income uh, uh, from a cash perspective, the operating and not operating activities are, are uh, providing uh, for the payment of interest and uh, capital uh, expenditures. Um, uh, so we pull the depreciation out. Uh, that's our biggest non-cash driver. Um, and uh, out of our operating expenses to come up with EBITDA of about a little over $2.8 million. Uh, we separate out our interest expense, our remaining interest expense down in non-operating. Um, and uh, the rest of those non-operating activities provided uh, almost $3.4 million of income. So in total, our operating and non-operating activities provided about $6.2 million for debt service and, uh, you know, capital, future capital expenditures. So there are any questions on August? We can move to the operations report. All right. I'd like to present September. Uh, gross revenue of $159.5 million for September was below budget by $6.7 million, or 4%. 
but above budget above September of 2018 by 4.8 million or 3.1 percent. Inpatient gross revenue of 103.5 million was below budget by 12.7 million and 3.4 million below September of 2018. Outpatient gross revenue of 56 million was above budget by 6 million or 12 percent and 8.2 million above September of 2018. So looking at the major drivers of, of revenue uh, variance, uh, emergency room visits were above budget by 206 or 5 percent, driving emergency room revenue up by 615,000 or 6.2 percent. Inpatient days were below budget by 501 or 10.8 percent, driving room and board revenue down by 4 million. The lower level of inpatient activity drove, also drove the ancillary services revenue below budget by 3.1 million or 4.2 percent. Looking at the key census statistics, um, average length of stay of 4.46 was below the budget of 5.06. The average length of stay was shorter than the September 2018 average length of stay of 4.81. Outpatient observation days were 4 or 2.5 percent above budget at 163 days, and observation days were 8 uh, above September of 2018. Average daily census of 137.8 was below the budget of 154.5 by 16.7 or 10.8 percent, and the average daily census was 8.4 below September of 2018. Looking at our emissions, um, emissions were above budget at, at 918, um, and emissions for the month were nine above September of 2018. And looking at our patient days, our pa patient days of 4,135 were below budget by 501 at, or 10.8 percent. Uh, patient days for the month were 251, 5.7 percent below of September 2018. Um, and again, we looked at it, we saw it, I mentioned it earlier, lower patient days were driven by the lower length of stay of 4.4%, of 4.46. Uh, in terms of our surgical trend, looking at our total surgical cases in September of 339 were below budget by 23 or 6.4%. Uh, surgical cases were 21 below September of 2018. Inpatient surgeries were 25 or 11.2 percent below budget and 199 and 30 below the September 2018 volume. Outpatient surgeries were two above budget and 140 and nine above September of 2018. In terms of the detail, uh, general surgical procedures were below budget by 37 or 18.3 percent. Um, and they were 39 below the 17 by, below September 2018 um, amount. Actual neurosurgical procedures were below budget by three or 11.5 percent. Cardiac surgical procedures were below budget by five or 50 percent. And joint replacement surgeries were above budget by 22 or 17.7 percent. Our cath lab had another very busy month. Um, so September cath lab procedures um, were 388, which were 50 or 14.8 percent above budget and 79 above the September 2018 actual. Inpatient cath lab procedures were above budget by 37 at 221 and 28 above the September 2018. Uh, outpatient cath lab procedures were above budget by 13 and above the prior year by 51. Just uh, getting down to the detail for the cath lab activity, neurointerventional radiology procedures were below budget by 4 or 66.7 percent. Nonvascular interventional radiology procedures were above budget by 3 or 4.7 percent. Uh, cardiac procedures were above budget by 11, which is 8.2 percent. And um, again, peripheral vascular procedures were again above budget by 40 or 29.9 percent. Looking at our deliveries, we were uh, down, we were below budget by five or 3.9 percent variance, and deliveries were three below September of 2018 um, actuals. In terms of our uh, non ER outpatient visits, um, again, we've been had another strong month. Um, visits were 8,000. 26, which were above budget by 974 or 13.8 percent, 
And these visits were above the September 2018 by uh, 1,129 or 16.4 percent. So the, the five areas that make up this increase, outpatient wound, wound visits were above budget by 95 or 37 uh, percent. Infusion center visits um, were above budget by 104 or 42.1 percent. Cardiac rehab visits were above budget by uh, 140, which is 20.6 percent. Lab visits were above budget by 161, 5.8%. And lastly, x-ray visits were above budget by 234, or 13.1%. In terms of our emergency room visits, uh, this month uh, we had visits of 4,302, which were above budget by 206, or 5%. And they were above the same period last year by 217 or 5.3%. In terms of our productivity indicators, our productive FTEs were below budget by 14.5 or 1.2% 1 at 1,247 our non-productive FTEs were above budget by 16.5, 8.9% at 202.9. Gives us a total FTEs of 1,447.6, which were above budget by two or 0.1%. So pretty close. However, looking at our productive FTEs per adjusted occupied bed, we were at 5.86, which were which was above the budget by five point a budget of 5.7, so 2.8 percent above the budget, and total FTEs per adjusted occupied bed of 6.82 were above the budget of 6.54 or 4.3 percent. Um, our Surgical cases at the Washington Outpatient Surgery Center um, were 508 cases in September. This was 25 or 5.2 percent above the budget of 483 and 34 above the September 2018 volume. Our clinic visits um, were 3,328, 3 which were below budget by 152 or 4.4 uh, percent for the month. In terms of we had Washington Urgent Care that was above budget, but we had um, some of our providers, physicians that were out at Nakamura, uh, Danielson Clinic, Newark, Warm Springs, and Ohlone Clinic that accounted for being below budget. Now looking at our uh, preliminary payer mix, um, for the month of September, it was favorable from the standpoint of government-sponsored uh, patient revenue made up 68% of total gross revenue, which is below the budget of 71.5%, but, uh, but above last year's percentage of 67.4%. HMO revenue was 2.5% of gross revenue, which is the same as the budget, and higher than last year's percentage of 1.6%. Our PPO revenue was 26.7% of gross revenue, which is above the budget of 23.6, but lower than last year's percentage of 27.6%. And then finally, private pay revenue was 2.8% of gross revenue, which is higher than the budget of 2.4%, but lower than last year's percentage of 3.4%. Looking at our key financial statistics, our days cash on hand for September ended at 163 days, an improvement of five days from last month. Our days of uh, gross revenue and accounts receivable were 53 compared to the prior month of 54. And uh, there were 884,758 in charity care applications pending or approved in September, which is greater than you can see from the prior year. Lastly, looking at our summary of homeless patient activity, there were 197 homeless patient encounters in, uh, in September of 2019. Our homeless patients uh, with more than one encounter accounted for 30 of the 197 encounters. Estimated incremental cost um, of Senate Bill 1152 for the month of September is 62,000. Estimated total unreimbursed cost of homeless care for the month of September is 583,000. An estimated total unreimbursed cost of homeless care for fiscal year 20 year to date is approximately 1.5 million. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Can we, any questions from the board? Seeing none, we've reached the end of our uh, agenda for this evening. It's necessary for us to have a, a closed session. 
So at this point in time, we'll adjourn to a closed session. Thank you for your attendance this evening. We are now reconvening to an open session and announce that no reportable action was taken during the uh, closed session. There being no further business this evening, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.